Consoled in the secret symmetry of your soul. May you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. Amen. I, I, do, I do love John O'Donoghue quite a bit. Um, if y'all haven't noticed that yet, <laughs> he's, he's pretty great. Um, so, um, Today is the last of the five sessions that we're doing on with Size Too Deep for Words and this exploration of the callings of the Spirit in our lives. Um, and just to, to make you all aware, um, we won't, there are four weeks in a row where we're not going to have 9 a.m. forum. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And uh, with the reading of the Passion at 8 o'clock, will probably bleed into not the 9 o'clock hour. And so we'll have some snacks and things happening down here in the interim time. The next Sunday is Easter Sunday, so there's brunch and an Easter egg hunt and all kinds of other things happening. The next week, the 7th, I will be at my sister's wedding in Cincinnati. And the Reverend Aaron Hensley will be here that day to... Uh, conduct both of our services and preach, um, and uh, I didn't put teaching this class. Uh, we'll see, maybe she'll do one, but I'll let y'all know. Um, and then the 14th, we're having a very special uh, workshop, Growing Young, a workshop, an all-parish workshop, that's going to follow our 1015 service and go several hours, and so to keep things kind of clean on the 14th, we won't, we won't have class then. But picking up on the 21st, we will have, we'll start our new series, which is called From Glory into Glory. And um, it's an opportunity for us to reflect on the glories of the past, who we've been, and claim our inheritance um, from those saints we've gone before. An opportunity to reflect on who we are now um, and learn um, some new skills for engaging the gifts of the people around us. Um, and so it's really congregational development, leadership empowerment, um, gift sharing kind of time. And so that will run for several weeks. There's some interruptions like when the bishop comes and things like that. But we'll roll that um, maybe even a tiny bit into Pentecost. Uh, so, um, so that's what's on the next frontier, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So anyways, but today is our, our final session. Um, and we began talking about how the Holy Spirit isn't easily boxed in. You know, the Holy Spirit is the comforter, but the Holy Spirit is also, you know, the disruptor. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the advocate, you know. Um, the Holy Spirit is fire and wind and a dove. I mean, the Holy Spirit is also, in Celtic Christianity, it's, it's the goose, which if you've ever spent time around geese, you know. They're not peaceful. <laughs> they have significant poop and they're very loud and can be quite aggressive. Um, so uh, the Holy Spirit is um, is just is hard to pin down. 
But today's, um, today is, I think, when we think of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, the call to action, the call to step up to the plate, I think this is kind of somehow, at times, how we imagine the Holy Spirit working in, the Holy Spirit does work in this way. So we had these five movements, movements of the Spirit, the call to go, the call to stay, the call to begin or start, the call to ex ex um, accept what you did not choose, and today is the call to step up or the call to action. And what distinguishes this calling is that often we step in, we step up to the plate, we, we move into action in, from a place of almost intuition and instinct. We don't ponder it and prepare for it for a long time, although in retrospect, we may see how we've been preparing for it all along. Something happens in our world and we just go, I must go, I must be the one to step in here and do something about the situation. I'm, 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 called, I'm being called right now, right here, to move. And, um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. And I thought I would begin with a little story for you. It's a story of, of a time when I stepped up, and it is a story of a time when a church stepped up and how those things went together. So when I was a youth minister back at Trinity Church, um, I, um, I was pretty new into my, my time there. And um, there was a little boy named Joe Wallace. We had a Wednesday night supper. Uh, and Trinity's on Jackson Avenue. It's not too far from the St. Thomas Housing Project. And Joe showed up, he was um, 10 years old, holding the hand of his seven-year-old sister. Uh, and he showed up at church on Wednesday night and said, I heard you have dinner here. And the church said, well, as a matter of fact, we do, come on in. And Joe and his sister had dinner, and, uh, and Joe just came back every Wednesday. And, um, and eventually we thought, well, we should get his mama's number and make sure this is okay. So we did that work. And then, uh, and then he started coming on Sunday. And Joe was just a natural Episcopalian. I cannot explain to you how or why. This kid was just a born Episcopalian. Um, and um, anyway. So Joe just kept coming around, coming around. But he had some behavior issues. He was um, he was very rambunctious. He was very theatrical. He was just um, he was a big person. He was a big personality, um, and he was a little bit older and physically bigger than um, the kids at his grade level. Um, and uh, and so we started to talk about moving Joe up into the youth group to have him be a part of what what I was doing. And so Joe was sitting next to me in church one day, and we had the hymnal out, and, uh, and we were singing, and I realized that Joe um, was pretending to read, that uh, he could not read, uh, and that he was just mouthing the words and trying to figure out how to, you know, trying to pretend like he could, like he could do it. Um, and I tested a couple of things with him and realized that he couldn't read. Um, and so I talked to a member of the congregation, and uh, we uh, got permission from his mom to take him to a learning specialist to be evaluated. And uh, he was evaluated, and it turned out he could not read. He, he had a, a processing disorder, dyslexia, a number of other things going on. Um, he was in the New Orleans public school system, which is the most dreadful thing in the whole wide world. Sorry, it just is. just a fact of life. Um, I called the school and worked with the school to try to see if there were ways we could get resources and um, I found out that Joe had been put in a behavior disorder and emotionally disturbed uh, classroom. I had him in my youth group and I said, well, he's in my youth group and he's not behaviorally disordered or emotionally disturbed. I would know. <laughs> I've taken this kid on retreat. Um, you know, he's just Joe. And, um, and it just became apparent that he was not getting the resources that he needed. And so he had this, um, he had this evaluation, which was very helpful. Um, we found a volunteer, a, a former reading specialist who was a member of the parish who began to, uh, tutoring Joe after school um, and working with him on his reading ability. Um, but then we realized that um, this school situation just wasn't going to get any better. He got into middle school and it only got worse. And, um, 
And so I went to the rector, Bill Riddle, and um, I said, can we, can we do something? Um, and then other people began to get interested, and I wrote a letter to the parish, and I said, told you a story. I'm going to cry telling you the story. Um, we worked with St. George's Episcopal School, which was uptown, and uh, they agreed to take Joe on as a student, but he would need so much remediation that they would have to hire a learning specialist and that would cost about $12,000 a year. They would waive tuition, but the additional staff that would be needed. And so, um, so, we, wrote a letter, so we wrote a letter, and, and the parish raised the money uh, for Joe to go to St. George's Episcopal School for the next two years, maybe three years. Um, they also raised the money for him to go to high school, Del Salle High School. Um, eventually, Joe moved out of a very dysfunctional and not good home situation into a home for boys. Um, and then finally, a parishioner from Trinity um, adopted Joe, right as he was about to graduate from high school. And then Joe went to Nickel State University, and Joe graduated from college. And then Joe worked for a little while. And then Joe went to the University of the South for seminary. And then Joe was working to priest in the Episcopal Church. And um, I don't know, it was just one of the most beautiful things I've ever had the pleasure to be a part of. And it wasn't, um, I don't get the credit, I mean it was a church being church. Um, um, in the moment I felt like it was a place of stepping up for me, it felt scary to ask, it felt like I was a little bit out of my lane. There were lots of forces that, you know, you don't get up in people's business, you know, like, was I getting too much in somebody's business, in somebody's life? Um, I was um, very sensitive to, um, to racial issues and all the different things that were wrapped up in, in helping and serving and, um, and not wanting to um, take anything <coughs> away from, um, uh, from from the black community that was also supporting Joe. Um, it was complicated. It was scary. Um, but there was just this willingness and this tremendous amount of love. Um, and um, and then the what happened to the parish, I think, was that they um, gave themselves permission to just love and help somebody just because he was one, because he was ours. Because he just kept coming. He was ours. He was our kid. And um, and it wasn't a program, and it wasn't an after-school thing, and it wasn't, you know, the way we usually like to help people is very choreographed. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's important. This wasn't choreographed. This was one kid who needed a lot of resources. And um, there were lots of reasons we could have said we couldn't do that. But somehow this church said that we could. And I was so proud of Trinity um, for doing that. Um, it kind of snapped them out of some complacency and it was really, really beautiful. So that's my Joe story. I can tell you more about it. There's more stories that have to go with Joe, but that's enough for it. Because he was a character. Um, he still is. Uh, but um, so, uh, so that is part of what, um, part of that idea of stepping up is that the, the Holy Spirit is, is compelling and moving in a way that we are just, um, we are just drawn to do something, to, to move into action, to step up to the plate. Um, and the biblical story that, um, that I think goes well with, with this uh, uh, particular movement of the Spirit um, might be the story of, of Esther um, in the Bible. Um, it's interesting, in the story of Esther, God is not mentioned one time in the whole book, and yet through the whole story, there is this uh, sense of providence working through what is happening in the narrative to make everything come together. Um, something's happening beneath the surface. 
So um, the king of Persia has a drunken feast. He wants his, he wants to show off his wife. She doesn't like it. He deposes her and says, you're not queen anymore. And then he holds a beauty pageant. Um, and Esther pretends she's not Jewish. And she enters the, the beauty pageant. And she's very beautiful. And she wins. And the king makes her his queen. Mordecai, who's also Jewish, happens to overhear a plot to kill the king. Um, and Mordecai and Esther go to the king and save his life. Uh, then along comes Haman. Uh, uh, he's an Ag Agakite, Agatite, and, uh, which is like a descendant of the Canaanites from way back when. Um, he is then elevated to um, the highest position under the king, and he demands that everybody kneel to him, uh, kneel before him, and Mordecai refuses uh, because you don't, you don't bow down to any lord but lord. Um, and then Haman convinces the king to have an edict that, uh, that all the Jewish people will be destroyed by decree. And, um, and Mordecai goes to Esther and says, Who knows, perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. And then the two of them put their heads together and there happen, there's all these great reversals in the story that happens after, afterwards. Um, she's not supposed to approach the king without an invitation, but she does so anyway and says, if I perish, I perish. Um, she hosts the king and Haman at a special banquet. Um, uh, things go a little bit awry and Haman decides he's going to kill Mordecai on a stake in the courtyard. Um, but then um, the king asks that the, uh, that the annals, that the record of, of all that has happened be read back to him. And in that reading, um, the, it, he remembers, oh yeah, Mordecai saved my life. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so he, because he's made a decree, he can't undecree the decree, but he makes a second decree that says that the Jewish people are to fight back um, and destroy those who come against them. And so the whole thing ends up kind of being mute and um, Mordecai is elevated. And, one of the underlying messages in this story is that when God seems absent, God is not. God is moving in this providential way. The Holy Spirit is moving underneath. The other thing that's really interesting about this story is that, um, is that you know, they're not like the most ethical, moral stalwarts of folks in the story, as are like lots and lots of people in the Bible are not. Um, and that seems to be part of how God works. Um, uh, when the Holy Spirit moves, it moves a regular, ordinary human being, just like you and me, who is a mixture of both wonderful gifts and talents and blessings and broken, yucky stuff. And, um, and God doesn't seem to mind. God uses us as we are. And the scriptures are full of Moses said, no, -uh, I'm not going to Pharaoh. And Isaiah said, I have unclean lips. I'm, I'm a mess. No. Jeremiah said, I'm just a boy. All through scripture, everybody feels inadequate to the task of what God is calling them to do. And yet somehow they go ahead and do it. Um, I have another story for us. Um, Gregory Boyle is a Jesuit priest. He's in L.A., and he's very famous for his work with gangs in L.A. And after a time of working with these gangs, he decides that he needs a school. He needs these, these young men are not educated. Um, they're not getting education the way they need to get it, or they've been kicked out of school or whatever. Um, and so he needs a school. He wants to have a school, and he needs a place to have a school. And there's a convent um, and, and, and six Belgian nuns live in this convent and Gregory Boyle prays about it and then he goes uh, to the nuns and he says will you guys move out of your convent and let me turn it into a school <laughs> and without missing a beat these six nuns say sure okay and they just do it um, sometimes the Holy Spirit is like that so like the nuns who said yes, 
we make some of our most consequential decisions seemingly on the spot, bypassing thought or logical reasoning. The situation presents itself and we would respond with something akin to instinct or intuition. Immediacy is the defining characteristic of these moments, although in retrospect, we can see how long we've been preparing for them. Uh, so, um, so these, that, that, email, that story comes from Marion Buddy's, Bishop Marion Buddy's book about, about the spirit and the call to courage. Um, and, um, and I just find that really, really interesting as we've moved through all of these. There is, you know, we always talk about impulse control um, and, you know, maybe not reacting to your reactions. But there are moments when reacting to our reactions is the pull of the Holy Spirit. And it can be difficult to discern when that is, but it's important. Um, so, um, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, we can feel that we are not ready for the call of the Spirit. Um, Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Simon, neither says, go away, I'm a son, right? But the message throughout Scripture is that whenever God issues the summons, it's normal to feel unprepared, but it doesn't matter. We enter the gap between our current capacity and what is needed, and there's always a gap. And when good things result, on account of that gap, we give the glory to God because we know in our bones that God made up the difference, that, the, um, that that extraordinary power that enabled us came from God and equipped us and, and, and made it possible. Um, Another, another way of thinking about that is to think about the story of the loaves and fishes, and this also comes from Bishop Buddy's book, but, you know, um, a lot of times we don't do things because we can't be guaranteed of the result that we would like to see. Um, we want to know how it's going to turn out. So if we feel like we don't have enough resources or enough things, um, we won't do the thing, right? And, um, and so we hold back. Um, and in some certain situations, I imagine, there's some, some, uh, some wisdom in that. Um, but the lesson of the loaves and the fishes is that not enough becomes more than enough when we offer what we have and God blesses and breaks it open, right? Um, God takes it, blesses it, and multiplies it. We're going to hear about more of that in the sermon with that little grain that's going to bear much fruit today. Um, um, that image of the loaves and fishes feeding a multitude is meant to encourage us all to give what we have when we know it's not enough. For reasons beyond our understanding, God consistently chooses to work through our imperfect, inadequate offerings. Um, so any thoughts on that so far? Anybody have any feedback on that? What do you think? There was a, one thing I noticed when I, um, in my ministry along the years, you know, um, and I'm very much of this stripe, right? If something's worth doing, it's worth doing, right? It's like kind of a it's a good little motto, right? It's a very Anglo model, right? If something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. If you can't do it right, let's not do it. Don't do it, right? Um, when I work with uh, Hispanic congregations, their motto is if something's, if something's right, it's worth doing, right? It doesn't matter if it's not perfect. It doesn't matter if it doesn't look all put together. If it's right, you do it. And, um, and I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, but but there's I think there's a middle I think there's wisdom in both of those things, right? That there's that we've got to find that space, and sometimes when something's right, you just do it, and you don't know if the result is going to make a difference, if it's going to turn out the way you wanted it to. Um, but giving the gift, giving what you have, um, uh, is um, is the point, not the result. 
Does that make sense? It's a spiritual thing. It's hard to get. It's hard to grasp. Anyway, and then the last thing about this stepping up to the plate is just the inevitable fact that when we step up to the plate, sometimes we are going to fail. Sometimes we're going to step up to the plate and swing and miss. Um, and we can think that that means that it wasn't really the Holy Spirit that was calling us. We can make that mean a whole bunch of negative things that it doesn't need to mean. Or we can choose to actually think of it as a learning experience, as a preparatory experience. We are going to step up to the plate. We are going to swing. And sometimes we are going to miss. We are not perfect. And sometimes we're not going to get it right. That doesn't mean God isn't calling us into something real and important. But when we swing and miss, how we respond to failure, how we respond to that challenge is critical for our own spiritual growth and development. And so um, y'all are familiar with Brene Brown, I'm assuming, right? You know, so she, she um, based, based her like last three books on, um, on this quote from Theodore Roosevelt um, about rising strong. And so, she, she, her first book, Daring Greatly, uh, begins with this quote, and then the next book, which is called Rising Strong, uh, is about when you fail and get your butt kicked, and you need to get back up. Um, but I'm going to read the quote from Theodore Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who lives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, enthusiasms and great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So um, that is the call to step up to the plate, I think, in that quote. We hear that call to step up to the plate, to get into the arena, to try, to make a difference. But when we fall and our face is marred and we get our butt kicked um, by life, how we respond to um, that experience is, is like super important. It's the formation of character in a human being. And so in Rising Strong, Brian, Brene Brown talks about the reckoning, the rumble, and the revolution. And, and the short version of the whole book is the reckoning is um, just looking at the truth. It's, you know, allowing yourself to see and name and talk about what happened. The rumble is the inner work that you must do to kind of own what happened to learn what you need to learn. And then the revolution is how you grow out of that experience in order to rise strong. Um, and so I just mentioned all of this because you know, who knows? After these five weeks, y'all might be paying extra special attention to the Holy Spirit, and, and one of you may step up to the plate, and if it doesn't all go swimmingly, I want you to know it's okay. <laughs> and, um, and there's a wonderful way to grow through and around that experience. Um, if y'all have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I'd like to let you visit with one another in your small groups. And anything. Okay. You guys are good. Well, introduce yourselves to the folks at your table. You have some small group questions at your table, and I invite you to um, talk with one another.